And Allison, go ahead and take it away. Okay. Thank you for that, Josh. Um, um, I want to thank everyone so much for joining me this afternoon. Um, as Josh mentioned, I'm a reference archivist in the um, archive search room in Raleigh, been an archivist for over about 10 years in the search room. And I've worked with many researchers on a variety of historical research topics and family history projects. And I have to say that working with the 18th and early 19th century records are some of my favorite, um, favorite projects. So um, I'm especially pleased to be able to, um, to speak about those today. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, records that document Revolutionary War soldiers for genealogical and historical research. Um, but we're also gonna take a more comprehensive look at documents that provide insight into the stories of people living in North Carolina during the Revolutionary War. Uh, these are going to include uh, patriots, loyalists, enslaved persons, and Native Americans. You may locate an ancestor uh, when you're researching these records, but if not, you'll still uh, get a closer look at this very pivotal moment in North Carolina's history. Uh, so uh, the record groups that we're going to be discussing today include government records, uh, such as county records, state agency, governor's papers, uh, then special collections, and the uh, military collections. So again, as Josh said, if you have any questions, um, you know, please keep them and uh, we'll have time at the end or, you know, he'll be moderating the chat. So go ahead and get started. So we're going to begin with county records. Um, probably be about 80% of the people that I come in contact with in the search room are working on their family history. And uh, genealogists rely heavily on various records created at the county government level. Um, county records are typically not where you're going to find exciting narratives of battle um, or patriotic speeches, but they are important because they give us a record of the daily life uh, for the ordinary citizen during conflict. And again, they are often the most likely place you will find the greatest numbers of records pertaining to an ancestor. And that remains so even during wartime. The challenge of county records is there is no one record series. It's gonna take awesome. you- yeah. Sorry, I need to interrupt. We have someone in chat asking if they can see, can't see your screen. Is anyone else having issues seeing her screen? Because she is sharing it and I see it. Some folks can see it, no issues here. Screen is shared, okay. Uh, sorry, Allison, it looks like, um, let's see. If you're not seeing her screen, you may wanna, I can't say go leave and come back in because you might, um, you might not lose your spot. Um, but try, try troubleshooting on your end, it, it is being shared. So I apologize for that. Uh, sorry, please continue, Allison. I, I apologize. Okay. Yeah. Sorry for anyone that's having trouble with that. Um, but we were uh, discussing county records and talking about um, the fact that they are used quite frequently by a uh, genealogist mainly. Um, but the challenge of county records is there is no one record series that takes you straight to the heart of military information. So the job of the researcher is to um, think about what kind of records that your family might have been creating during this time and then locate and study them and then follow the path they're going to lead you. And I'd like to provide information on how to use county records in general at the State Archives. Uh, we are not set up in that you can type a name, for example, into a database or our online catalog and all names that are pertain to that person are tagged. Uh, the records are arranged by county first and then they're arranged by record type. And then depending on the record type, they're arranged either chronologically or alphabetically. So um, it is imperative because of this that researchers determine what North Carolina county or counties 
uh, the ancestor lived in. Uh, sometimes you can do this if you need help learning that. You can discover uh, the correct county by consulting statewide indexes to census records or wills, marriage bonds, for example. Um, you can also consult county abstracts and then, of course, their websites like FamilySearch and Ancestry.com, which have a lot of um, uh, indexes that can help you with that. And once you find your ancestors county, uh, please keep in mind that counties have ancestors and descendants too. So there'll likely come a time when you'll have to start looking in another county. Um, that your ancestor may not have physically moved themselves, but the county boundaries are changing. Um, so you have to kind of keep that in mind. You, you might start out in one county, but then your research will take you to another one. And once you determine the county home of the ancestor, you want to investigate if there's any significant records loss because there has been for many counties in North Carolina. Uh, the counties shown here in red have all sustained fires, some of them more than once. Um, counties shown in yellow have records lost due to reasons other than fire. Um, so 70 counties out of 100 have known records loss, uh, unfortunately. So in counties with records loss, it calls for um, a lot of creative thinking and thought and planning in um, trying to, to adjust your research around those limitations. And there's, speaking of our time period, um, specifically, there's instances that we have it recorded that clerks of court refused to turn over records to officials in the newly created state government. Um, there's tall tales that um, the clerks in Bladen and Duplin County, for example, refused to turn over county records. Um, there's also another tale that comes out of Orange County that James Monroe, who was a very prominent loyalist, um, had his property confiscated. And as a result of that, kind of took some revenge and took the county records and buried them in the woods. So this is kind of a tale that originates out of there. So who knows? And um, here we have a graphic of the population increase that was happening during the Revolutionary War. Um, you have a lot of settlers from the North uh, begin to move South, especially at the beginning of the war, um, This, while the South was still relatively peaceful in those early years uh, before the Southern campaigns. Um, so the population increase has been estimated at around 100,000. So there's quite a lot going on there. And with this westward expansion, uh, the new settlers found themselves many miles away from uh, any seat of government. So they began to petition uh, for new courts that were closer to their home. And this is how new counties were created. Um, so during the eight years of the American Revolution that we're talking about here, North Carolina legislators created 18 new counties. Um, they did also abolish at least two, Trine and Butte, which are what we call now defunct counties. Um, so there's a lot going on during that time period as far as population. And these are the series of records that we have for each county. Um, including the defunct counties that we just talked about. Um, the CRX records that you see at the bottom um, are county records that came to us from sources other than the direct county offices. So sometimes uh, you'll find county records that probably were originally in the county, but they've ended up in um, out of that custody. And so they've come back to us, but we don't mix them in with the other uh, county records that came directly from the county. So um, it's important to remember them. They sometimes get forgotten, but they are really helpful records. And so again, the researcher's job is to think about what kind of records maybe their ancestor was creating at this time. And then those are the ones that you're gonna wanna try to look for and um, study. 
unfortunately for North Carolina, uh, we have a long history of our local records um, agencies, the Register of Deeds, the Clerks of Court, um, transferring these local records from county courthouses to the state archives. Um, this is really beneficial, you know, not only for the good of the, the records um, and that they're in a safe place, um, but it also means that researchers, if they start out one line of research in one county, they can go and to another county records without actually having to leave. They can do all that in one place. So again, they contain a wide variety of information for genealogists and historians. And what you see on the screen here are just a few. Um, so wide range of information, as you can see arranged chronologically. Uh, for the most part, court records are arranged chronologically. They contain extraordinary details about the community. I feel like there's no better way to really understand your time period of interest in those local communities than by just reading the pleas and quarter session uh, minutes and then after 1806, the superior court minutes. Uh, one thing to remember, however, about court records during this time is that uh, transcripts of trials were almost never kept. I think back then, I mean, we what we today think of as maybe trial testimony um, or transcripts or witness testimony and that kind of thing, they did not keep back then. Um, what they're keeping are the charge, the judgment, and the sentencing. So don't always have as much information as you might expect um, in the minutes. But we do have civil and criminal action papers, which is a, another series that you can also check to see if there's any accompanying information that was um, associated with a case that didn't actually get into the minutes. Those are also arranged chronologically for searching. Also paying attention to the actions of the court um, the venue might change, like it might have been sent up to an appeals court or to a higher court. And in that case, then you have to start looking at other court records to kind of follow how that case went. So one of the um, most helpful, I think, um, is the oath of allegiance that you'll find in um, the quarter and police sessions. Um, according to a law passed by the General Assembly session in New Bern in um, the uh, spring 1777 session, and they passed a law saying that an oath of allegiance was required by anyone appointed or elected to serve as a county official. Um, so an example of that that you would find is, is that this is a 1778 docket from uh, Wilkes County where Richard Allen was chosen as sheriff. And this is uh, that he took the oath of allegiance and that's recorded here. Um, another little tidbit about that, about kind of making sure that you kind of make sure you check all records. We have a officials bond series that um, also records bonds that officials took out. Um, and a bond is, you know, you have marriage bonds, you have officials bonds, different kinds of bonds, but the, um, the intent is the same behind all of those in that you agree to pay a penalty sum of money if you don't fulfill the conditions of the bond. So basically he's saying that he will uh, follow the, um, the conditions and that he did take the oath of allegiance. And uh, we do know that Richard Allen, he served um, in the military uh, we know that from other records, but we know from this record that he also served in civil capacities. So you have different records that will um, record his military service and his civil service. And one thing about the Oath of Allegiance is uh, taking into consideration the practical purposes of taking the oath. Um, you may not be a diehard patriot, but if you were a merchant or if you were a citizen, a private citizen who wanted to have any dealings with the court, like file a deed or probate an estate, you had to take that oath of allegiance to be able to um, have any dealings in the court. So, um, but I think the thing about the, the oaths of allegiance is um, they were willing to bond themselves out for large sums of money. So they were taking that oath seriously for whatever reason they were taking it. 
The um, county police and quarter minute books also have declarations of service. Uh, the Superior Court minutes do as well after 1806. But um, they include declarations of service by Revolutionary War veterans who were intending to apply for a federal pension. North Carolina didn't really have a um, veterans pension system like they would have later on for the Civil War, for example. But uh, the federal government was issuing issuing pensions. They um, had a, uh, requirements were more strict early on. So later on, um, they were it wasn't quite as strict to uh, apply for a pension. But what these are doing is um, they're going into court and they're giving this information as a testimony that then would be passed on with their application for the pension. And um, these are uh, the act, the pension act that they were applying for um, provided that officers and enlisted men who had served at least two years in the Continental Line, um, volunteers or militia were eligible. Um, so it was, uh, as the years went on and the pension laws changed, um, the 1832 one did not require applicants to demonstrate need. So that opened it up for more veterans. And this is a declaration of service for Solomon Witherington from Craven County. And it was reported in the Craven County Superior Court minutes um, from 1832. This declaration is seven pages long um, in the court docket. And it includes a wealth of information, genealogical and um, military service related. Um, some of this information is on the screen so you can see how, what a um, thorough testimony he was giving. Um, he gives his age, uh, his date of birth, that he was a substitute three times, um, the names of those who he replaced, recollections of the actions he was involved in. Um, so also the people that he was serving with. So it's wonderful. Um, the court approved this declaration and it was certified. And so then it would have gone on with his application to the federal government. Um, these declarations of service have been abstracted in uh, genealogical publications, North Carolina publications. There's also a list of names and counties compiled by uh, Betty Kamen, which is included in our military collection finding aid, which you can access through our website. We have um, the miscellaneous category of county records. Uh, certain county records were compiled into a miscellaneous category because they were of such specific nature and they were so unique that it was difficult to decide what record series they should be in. And they, um, they run the gamut uh, as to what kind of information may be found. And so they should definitely not be overlooked. Uh, if you're lucky, you may find genealogical information that pertains to a family you're researching, but they're so diverse in nature that you can also find information that is of uh, military significance as well. Uh, one example here is um, the an, an oath of allegiance that's in the miscellaneous category. And again, we've already seen an example of that in the court docket. Um, but there are also loose paper copies of Oath of Allegiance that were circulated throughout the county for signatures. Um, so this is one from Bertie County that includes the signatures um, or the marks of, the, of, the, of those taking the oath. Um, so it's another good place to confirm if an oath was taken. This oath also includes an exact text of the original oath that was passed in the General Assembly, which was not often always recorded in court. So it's another great find in that you actually have the law wording in the document. Uh, from the Chuan County miscellaneous records, we have a list of Continental soldiers, uh, which is was compiled on the back of a tax form dated 1903. So um, this was not created uh, in that time period. And it's interesting to wonder why somebody in the clerk's office decided to create a list. Um, but we take it on face value because it was transferred directly from the county. So someone in the county created that list. Um, and I mentioned it as an example of a record that you may not expect to find. 
Um, but once you do, it's great because it names soldiers of the 5th Regiment in Chuan County that you may not find described so well in any other kind of document that's so specific to Chuan County. There's also a group within the miscellaneous records uh, called the Slave Records. And these records contain petitions and papers concerning emancipation or manumission, among other things. And on the screen is a document from Perquimen County Slave Records. It's a manumission petition for James, who was a former slave, Thomas Newby, in um, Perquimen County. And it's a very lengthy description of the merits of James during the Revolutionary War. Um, the things that he did, uh, the fact that he was taken prisoner but returned back to the American army. Um, so uh, it's basically a petition spelling out why he should be um, manumitted. Um, and you would think that because there's a petition and because his um, that so many in the community uh, were approving it, it, but it still was difficult because many times these petitions had to be uh, put before the General Assembly and they had to approve them before they became legal. But it's uh, uh, another example of a record you would find in the miscellaneous category. Uh, so uh, uh, some of the things that I just wanted to point out about guides, uh, there is a county records guide, which is categorized as either original county records or microfilmed records, and they're grouped within each category by series. There is a printed edition of this, but there's also PDF or documents on our website that you can search by county. Um, I'll just point out that the guides are, they, are, are, they describe the archival holdings and the microfilm copies, but that will change as the range and description units uh, continue to, to transfer records from counties. So, um, but for the time period that we're talking about for that um, late 18th century, early 19th century, pretty much all the records that are going to be here um, are in this guide. These are a couple of other reference books that will help make your work in North Carolina records easier. Um, that also help you prepare and advance for any kind of research questions or if you come to the search room in person, um, these will kind of go ahead and give you, save you some time. Um, North Carolina Research uh, by Helen Leary is a, a, a volume that we use every day as archivists ourselves. It's, um, it provides really good research strategies uh, for using records at the archives and it's focused on North Carolina records specifically and it doesn't really deal in gener generality so um, it's a really definitive guide to North Carolina. The formation of North Carolina counties is another uh, good resource and the Gazetteer uh, is a dictionary of places um, of historical geographical places in the state and how they the names may have changed over time. You may see a name in a document that you don't recognize, but the Gazetteer may be able to help you. And so we'll talk about state agency records. Uh, we house records from all 100 counties, but we also house records created by government agencies. And these include um, our departments, such as Department of Public Instruction, Health and Human Services, uh, but then the governor's office, the Supreme Court, the General Assembly. Um, so all different, pretty much representation of, of all our government agencies. And not all of these are the best sources for genealogical um, or to search for genealogical or military or civil service. Some are more helpful than others. And so those are the ones that we're going to, to take a look at more closely. So the Secretary of State records that I want to focus on are the Revolutionary War military papers and the bounty land warrants. Um, they both document the application process and final granting of land grants that were awarded to veterans of Continental Line Service. Uh, we refer to these land warrants as, or grants, as Tennessee land grants because the land at the time uh, was Western North Carolina, the Western boundary, but um, when North Carolina seceded territory to the federal government and it became Tennessee, that land is now in modern day Tennessee.
we have over uh, 1,400 folders of depositions and proofs submitted by soldiers and their heirs in support of their bounty claims of service for these uh, uh, warrants or land grants. And the General Assembly would appoint three commissioners who would oversee this process, and they would look over these petitions and the documents that were submitted for proof of service. Um, they could, they usually had to have someone also file on their behalf. Um, and if you were a guardian, for example, you had to submit a power of attorney proving that you had power of attorney. So um, they did have some, some more stringent rules. Um, other information that you'll find in these are the discharge papers, affidavits, army commission records. This image that we have on the screen here is uh, for soldier John Wilson. Um, he has appointed his son Noah to make application for um, the to the Secretary of State's office to obtain a uh, obtain a military land warrant. So this is great for genealogy because you know it, it's talking about his children, providing a name, more about his family, but then it's also uh, helpful for proving military service because he's talking about his services to the Continental Line. Um, and the bounty land warrants, again, Tennessee land grants is what they're more commonly uh, known as here at the State Archives. Um, in 1783, by then they were opening up land offices, the Secretary of State's office was, to issue these uh, uh, warrants. Uh, they were issued from 1783 up to 1797 in North Carolina. So North Carolina um, representatives or agents from the Secretary of State's office would go out and to set apart land for military grants. Um, so then it would be granted by that land office and then it would be filed in the Secretary of State's office. Um, but then there's a second series that consists of the grants issued after 1797. Um, and those were issued by the Tennessee government after the um, new state had been created. And um, these land grants are also extremely um, rich with information. Uh, they usually will specifically state Continental Line Service, uh, which makes them different than the other land grants that were awarded, um, because they are specifically for service, basically in lieu of payment is what they were being issued for. They were being granted land instead of payment uh, money. Uh, so they'll include uh, the warrant number of the grant, the acreage, the date that it was issued, and the names of the assignees. Um, the assignees are a lot of times uh, veterans that receive these land grants. You know, it's on the very western part of the frontier, so someone living in the east may have no interest in moving out to the western part of the state, so they would sell them a lot of times uh, or turn them over to someone else. And this particular um, land grant, uh, John Wise, and it states clearly that he's a corporal in the state line. Uh, so we know right there that he's eligible, but he has assigned it over to Matthew Locke. And so it's probably hard to see on the document, but on the back of it, it talks about how uh, that was approved for Matthew Locke to be the one that's given the final grant. And um, those are indexed in our online catalog doc, either by the name of the original uh, or the original person and then the assignee. So you can search by both. Then we have the um, treasurer and comptroller's papers. Uh, there is a register of the North Carolina Continental Line. Um, these were created by pay and muster rolls. Uh, they were sent to Philadelphia in 1790, uh, again, to kind of help out with that pension system. But um, the register is arranged by the initial of the surname and then within each letter by the regiment that they served in. Uh, they have some limitations. Uh, some roles didn't indicate what regiment the soldier served in. Um, that can create a problem within the register because then they just kind of tacked him on to the end of some of the other regiments. So not completely accurate in that. Um, 
and they don't always name everybody like some of the officers they don't mention specifically by name but it, it's still a really good source um, there are state pensions to invalid and widows we talked about how they didn't really have a, a overarching pension system but they did have a pension system in 1784 for invalids and widows they're not that many of them that survive that we actually have there's probably about 97 in total that we have but they were eligible that they were um primarily for militia, you were eligible for this pension if you were in the militia, not necessarily just continental line. Uh, if the invalid died, then the widow was eligible for the pension. Um, but the revolutionary pay vouchers and army accounts, uh, they're mostly fiscal in nature, nature, but they can provide some really great genealogical information. Um, they can also provide a location for a person. They were um, administered through a district. So these districts, fiscal districts, were established to handle uh, the new voucher system that they had created to um, uh, issue payment. And the districts consisted of a board of auditors that would hear public claims for services. They would fix prices um, for goods and services. And then they issued vouchers and recorded the payments in running account books. Um, knowing what district the voucher was issued from can help you determine if you have the right person. Because you may have a voucher that is has a common name. So you may have like five different John Smiths. But if you know what district they're being paid out of, like Wilmington, for example, if they live in Wilmington, but they're, the voucher says that it's from the Halifax district, then it's quite possible it's not the person you're interested in because they probably wouldn't have traveled that far. They, they wouldn't have been submitting a voucher that far away from home. And this is a, an example of a pay voucher. Uh, they were issued for goods purchased for the war effort. Um, they could also be for militia service as well, though. Um, supplies are very common, what they're being paid for, like uh, food, crops, um, but they could also be continental line or militia. And they were intended to replace cash as payments. So they could be issued very early on and then uh, claimed later. Um, the number on them and the um, can be helpful when you're searching for them in the account books because theoretically those are supposed to match up. Uh, this particular voucher was issued in the district of Wilmington, so we know it's Wilmington. Um, we know the date and we know that John Dahl was being paid nine pounds for his service in the militia, so that's pretty clear. There are some complications with the vouchers. When they were redeemed, they were hole punched. Um, so obviously we lose some information if it was punched in a really bad place, bad for us. Um, sometimes you can supplement lost information in, from the account books that they were registered in, but not always. Um, the voucher number again, uh, up there at the top, that 2523 should match up with the entry number in the uh, account books. Some of them have rejected written on them without giving a reason why, um, but they were they could be traded. They were often traded in a bartering system. So um, they may not be in lieu of cash. Again, they may not be paid right away, but then when they redeem their voucher, they um, will have this. But so sometimes they could trade them with um, other people if they needed it sooner. Um, the army accounts, the issuance and uh, redemption of the vouchers were recorded in these volumes known as revolutionary army account books. Um, they're not as easy to decipher as vouchers and they're not as informative. Uh, but an entry in the account book may be the only record um, of payment if the actual voucher doesn't survive. Uh, there's four series of them. Uh, they are arranged by like Roman numerals. Then there's uh, 
some that are uh, lettered. And they were originally 70 books that were kind of bound together. So um, there's some kind of uniqueness in how they're arranged in the way that they are assigned book and page numbers. Um, uh, complications again, talk going back to that, there's different series that were grouped together. Um, there was a fraud scandal that was going on in some areas where these account books were being issued from. Um, but Helen Leary in the um, guide to research that we talked about earlier gives excellent descriptions of the information that's in each volume because they each were coming out of different districts and they um, were payments for different things. Um, the Secretary of State Finding Aid, which is in the Legacy Finding Aids collection on our website, also provides descriptions, which are really helpful when you're looking at these. They also um, cover non-revolutionary military like um, Chickamauga Expedition in the Cherokee Wars a little bit later on. So there's a little bit of mixing in there, but um, sometimes that's all that remains uh, if you don't have any other kind of supporting voucher or anything like that. You, you know there was payment, you may not necessarily know for what, but they were being paid for something. So the governor's papers, uh, North Carolina had four governors that served during the Revolutionary War, as you see on the screen here. Um, Josiah Martin was the colonial governor when the war broke out. Um, he fled New Bern in 1775, and I love to think of him, he was trying to govern from a ship that was moored in the Cape Fear River off Wilmington, North Carolina. And I think he thought he still had some kind of authority, but he didn't. But he's still hanging around off the coast trying to govern. But um, the first state governor is Richard Caswell. Um, this, these records will include uh, correspondence, a lot of it, uh, about military business, uh, supply, about supplies, and then correspondence to and from the Continental Congress about military and political matters. Um, and it also includes correspondence with the public. Uh, you have the, the average citizen that can write in to the governor with any kind of concern. So um, there's a wide range of topics ranging from issues on the home front as well, as well as military topics. And I like to think that they serve as a reminder that government was not just responsible for military matters, but also for the needs and the cons of those at home. Um, the correspondence in these papers is arranged by date and not by subject. Um, unfortunately, some of them are indexed in uh, binders in the search room or finding aids on our online collection, but a lot of them are not indexed to a great level. So um, it may come down to having to just read through the correspondence chronologically. Um, some of the papers have been published, uh, but not necessarily in their entirety. Uh, but the good thing is these early governor's papers have been digitized and they're on our digital collections website as part of the historical governor's papers digital collection. Some of the other Revolutionary War era government records, uh, the General Assembly session records petitions, um, you have petitions to the General Assembly from widows, orphans, uh, people asking about the bounty land claims. So there's, again, another wide range of petitions that are in there. They're not indexed, uh, they're just scattered throughout the papers, but the session records themselves are arranged by year. And so if you have a particular date, um, you can go through them that way. We do have something called the Delamar transcripts, which are some typed abstracts from petitions uh, that were done by um, Ms. Delamar. So we have copies of those in the search room and it's sort of an abstract I and mean, it kind of gives you the names of the people, um, but it's a little outdated because it's referring to legislative papers, which are not exactly the same as the way they're arranged now. So I would say that if you're gonna use those, they're helpful, but they're kind of complicated as well. So our, our military collection, 
So the mission of the military collection at the State Archives is to document and preserve records detailing the state of North Carolina's very rich military history, um, beginning um, as our time as a British colony in the 17th century um, to present day. Um, again, they document the history and development of North Carolina's military history. Um, history for military conflicts uh, for soldiers, but also for residents um, and enlisted, uh, those who might have been training at a training camp in North Carolina. And these records also document the role and experiences of civilians on the home front. Um, at present, we have records beginning uh, with the Spanish-American invasion in 1742 up to the Iraq wars in 2010. Um, so you'll see some on the screen here, some of the things that they include. So it's a wide range of documents that are in these collections. And so we're going to focus on the War of the Revolution collection. There are 14 boxes that make up this collection. Um, there's the finding aid in our online catalog that you can search by collection. There's um, also binders in the search room if you're visiting us in, in person that have um, break down these 14 boxes. Um, the finding aid, which you can also get online, also has a uh, compilations of loyalist material that might be find, found in this collection as well. And some of the subject topics are on the screen there. And most of these have been digitized and they're part of the Revolutionary War Era collection, which is available on our digital collections website. This is an example from the that military collection, uh, the Board of War Recruiting Instructions from 1777. Um, in North Carolina, there was a board of war created by the General Assembly uh, during the Revolutionary War time. Um, they were going to supervise all military operations within the state. So they were overseeing uh, mobilizing troops, proc procuring supplies for the military, delivering supplies to the militia. Um, they can contain the names of the purchasing agent, agents, militia leaders, names of farmers that are selling supplies as well. So those can be really um, helpful. Um, they also discuss the British army movements and they also supplied um, various items, commodities to counties that were in need that had asked for help with supplies. Um, most of the Board of uh, War records have also been digitized and they're available in that collection online. Some of the most helpful Revolutionary War records in the military collection and probably in most of the records that pertain to the Revolutionary War um, are our troop returns collection. And uh, it includes information on both Continental Line and militia. There's eight boxes of these that cover the year 1747 to 1893, but most of them are um, pre-Revolutionary War, like 1760s uh, through about um, 1813. So it's mostly our time period of interest. Um, they have militia unit records. They, ha um, excuse me, uh, militia returns. They have Continental Line. Uh, there's pay and muster rolls, which will list names. This particular list that we have here is a muster roll of Colonel William Lee Davidson's company, who was the 1st Battalion, North Carolina. Um, this document specifies the commission dates for the officers and the appointed um, officers, like the corporals, and that includes their names, which is also very helpful. They have returns from the Continental Line, which also include names. Um, the returns from the militia though, however, are definitely provide names, not just of the officers, but of the um, just regular troops. Um, and the drafty, there's also some drafty records included in the troop returns. And these are uh, surprisingly uh, good information because they'll give a physical description sometimes of the, of the person, which is quite, interesting that they are requ um, recording their uh, height and their weight, but 
they are considered drafty records. So I guess that goes into that. But that just goes back to like all the different kinds of information that are in those trip returns. And so we have an extensive group of mostly non-government records that make up our special collections. Um, these are various types of manuscripts and all the different kinds of things that you see on the screen here um, that were collected by a private individual or a family or an organization that documents significant moments in North Carolina's history and culture. Um, the State Archives actively seeks uh, collections that illuminate this history and culture. So um, we regularly accept collections from private donors. Um, we also have uh, special collections at our mainstay archives in Raleigh, but we also have two uh, satellite archives, one in um, Asheville, the Western Regional Archives, and then we have one in Mantio on the coast, which is the Outer Banks History Center. And um, these repositories um, are mainly special collections, but what they do is they focus on um, more local history, like Asheville would be the mountains, and then the Outer Banks History Center in Mantio would be focusing on collections pertaining to the coast. We have a few uh, guides here. There's a guide to the private manuscript collections that details uh, the collections in, that include the Revolutionary War um, and just Civil War as far as military goes. Um, but some of them are, as you can imagine, there's huge collections uh, that you really need to think about subject terms um, and check when you're checking in the index because some of these collections are very large. But also keeping in mind that this guide was published um, in the 80s, so it only covers collections received by that time. And you know we're constantly, obviously, receiving new collections. Um, but their finding aids for the new collections are added to the appropriate binders in the search room, as you see here. They're also entered into our online catalog doc. So um, it you should definitely. Um, make sure you're up to date with the finding aids online and in our online catalog. But the, the guide is something that, you know, we do, do still um, very frequently uh, consult. The search room uh, binders that you see here of the finding aids, there a lot of them are very um, descriptive and they're very good about these large collections kind of narrowing them down to a box level. So you're not going through a bunch of large collections for information that you're not really looking for. This is an example um, from the Jethro Sumner papers. Uh, he was a Brigadier General, a, a Virginia native, but he was a resident of Warren County, North Carolina. So um, he, this includes copies of correspondence uh, during the French and Indian War and the Revolutionary War. He talks about desertion, um, the relationship between the militia and the regular Continental Army, and um, he talks about uh, battle plans. So this is, you know, kind of a reminiscence from someone who was involved in the Revolutionary War. Uh, we have several different collections that pertain to North Carolina, North Carolinians during this time period. Uh, James Iredell, again, a governor um, in the colonial period. Um, William Hooper and uh, the Caswells, Richard and William, are just a few examples. Okay. okay. So we'll talk a little bit about that special group of people. Uh, we won't, we should never overlook the fact that there was a strong loyalist movement in North Carolina. Many who opposed uh, the breakout of hostilities with um, Britain for a variety of reasons, obviously economic and political are um, some of them, but you have reasons that are maybe even more personal. Um, the Scottish, there's a, a large group of Scottish, Scottish Highlanders who immigrated to the Cumberland County area um, after, the, after Culloden um, in 1746. They immigrated, uh, a lot of them, to that one little area. And so they had taken an oath of allegiance after Culloden 
and when they moved here, um, they really didn't want to break that oath. So um, you have a little small group of people in there who, um, because they're coming from that past of taking an oath of allegiance to the king, don't necessarily want to jump right back into that. And so several of the loyalists that were at the Battle of Moores Creek um, came from that area. That's just one little example of, of, loyal, of a loyalist group. And if you're searching loyalist as a group, or if you're searching for a loyalist ancestor, um, there's obviously materials in the county and in the government records um, and the military collections as well. So there's genealogical material, um, but there's information in those about loyalist movements, a lot of talk about treason and land confiscation that can be helpful for your research. This is a um, from the county records, a list of Tories from Burke County. Uh, interesting find in that it includes the names of those who were being accused of Tories and then those that were witnesses against them. So this is a, a great find in the Burke County miscellaneous records. And this is one of my favorites that I've run across. It's from Craven County, North Carolina, um, a trial for treason from 1780. Um, it's an account of Jethro Oates, who was on his way to Patrick Stewart's, who he had been informed was a friend of the king. Um, but he was stopped by some Continental soldiers. Um, and he thought they were British. Don't know why. But um, he confessed to him, to them, that he was a friend of the British. And uh, those soldiers took him to New Bern and put him on trial for treason because he confided in the wrong people that night, apparently. I will talk a little bit about um, the confiscation acts. Uh, there were several of these acts. In fact, the history of land confiscation during the Revolutionary War time period, uh, you could talk for days about that. So we won't get too heavily into it, but there were um, acts passed by the General Assembly from 1777 to 1783. So the whole time period that we're interested in here. Um, and basically a simple explanation is that those known to have loyalist leanings or refusing to take the oath of allegiance um, could have their property confiscated and their goods confiscated. Um, the county would appoint commissioners who were responsible for assessing and then overseeing the auctioning of the confiscated property. And if you find an ancestor who purchased confiscated land, it can provide you with a interesting history of the community, I find. Um, but they can also be illuminating for those researching political history as well. Um, and what you see on the screen here is a deed that is on microfilm. If it looks a little odd to you, um, that is a microfilm screen. I just include it so that you would see um, what that looks like because most of the deeds that we have, we have microfilm copies of here in, in our archive search room, microfilm room. So when you're looking at deeds here, you'll mostly be looking at microfilm. But what you see is uh, the most telling part of this deed is that it says it's land being sold at auction, which was confiscated from Henry Eustace McCullough, who was a very large landowner in um, Anson County, uh, Rowan County, Guilford County. So in that Piedmont middle part of the state. And he was a, a very prominently known loyalist. Um, he had been an easy target for land confiscation, uh, partly because he left North Carolina pretty early on and he never came back. So he, um, it was easy to confiscate from him. But I think like what's interesting about that is not only were they selling off the land, but they had taken his goods, like his furniture or whatever was on the property they were selling off. And the other thing is, is that, and if you look at the deed, it refers you back to an act of the General Assembly. And they had actually passed an act specifically naming Henry Eustace McCullough as someone that they could confiscate property from. So a whole specific law that they passed just about being able to take his property. And so a lot of these Rowan County deeds, you'll find the wording that's very similar to this one where they're explaining the legal reasons why they can do that. 
this is an example of um, one of our private collections, a uh, loyalist Donald McDonald. He was a um, part of that Skylish Highlander, Scottish Highlander area in that Cumberland County area. He was at the Battle of Morse Creek. Uh, he was uh, leading a group of loyalists in that confrontation. This is a correspondence that he had where he was addressing the um, Patriots and telling them that if they will surrender, they will be pardoned by the king. And they just need to surrender and swear allegiance to the king and their life would be a lot easier and it would be a lot better according to him. Um, so that's a interesting point of view from a loyalist. We'll talk about our digital collections. We have a very active digital services unit that is continuously scanning original records um, that are housed here at the State Archives to add to our digital collections online. Um, at present, there's really not that many county records represented in the digital collection. I mean, as you can imagine, it, there's so many county records, such a large amount of records um, that it's not really feasible at this point to um, digitize a lot of them. And a lot of them have already been scanned and they're available on websites like FamilySearch and Ancestry.com if you're not familiar with them. They have a lot of different states, not just North Carolina, but they've uh, got a lot of different states, uh, county records online. Um, and we don't want to duplicate anything that they've already put online. That's um, We'd rather focus on things that are not online. One of our collections is the Revolutionary War era digital collection. It's relatively new, um, but it contains records from a variety of different record groups that pertain to this era. And the, uh, the record on this screen is part of the Continental Congress records that um, these Continental Congress records are records that were generated from uh, representatives from North Carolina who were attending the state conventions and then also the um, the conventions up in Philadelphia. And this particular document that was found in that collection is um, it documents the diplomatic discussions that were being held between select leaders of the Muscogee Nation and the Cherokee Nation who met with representatives from the Continental Congress in Philadelphia and they met in Fort Charlotte, South Carolina in 1776. And Interestingly enough, the majority of this whole discussion is several pages long, so we don't have the whole document here, but um, most of it talks about, it, it's an appeal from the Continental Congress to these uh, Native American nations to not get involved. Don't join the American War of Independence uh, for either side. Uh, so, there, it's basically an appeal to their chiefs and to their representatives to just kind of not get involved. Um, the document also talks about trade and land encroachment um, and other correspondence that they wanted to pass on to the Continental Congress. Um, and unfortunately, we only have a copy of the discussion, discussion that was written by the, the committee members, and we don't have anything that documents the thoughts or the reflections of the Native Americans during this um, conversation that's going on. So um, in conclusion, I want to thank you so much for your attention and for your interest in records pertaining to the Revolutionary War at the State Archives. Um, my contact information is on the screen. So um, you know, please contact me or any of our excellent reference staff with any questions you may have in the future. Or um, if you want uh, need additional or want just want additional information on a topic that we've talked about, um, we also look forward to working with you. Um, if you have the opportunity to visit the search room in person, we would love to meet you. Um, and I always say that the search room could be the basis for a great reality show. So if you ever want to, we would love to see you there. Thank you so much, Allison. We, you're getting some applause here in the chat and a lot of thanks from people. Uh, I know we're over time, uh, it was since 4.03, 
So if you need to leave, please, uh, I understand. Uh, but if you have questions, you can put them into the chat uh, or sorry, into the q and I'll go over a few. I've been answering every question as they've come in in Q&A. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, so we, hopefully we've been gotten to a, a lot of them. There's a couple that I wanted to get your uh, take on, Allison. Um, first of all, we had someone ask, um, let's see. There's one that was I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, the question is, my fourth great grandfather was from Orange County and served in the Revolutionary War. Uh, the asker has found his widow's petition and has traced his service. However, he has the same name as another Orange County man. They may be related and she's trying to trace their parentage. Uh, any suggestions on which records they would have that would that could help with this uh, i recommended maybe wills and estates but do you have any other thoughts as or, or how you could maybe use wills as wills and estates when you have two people of the same name what other records might be helpful to figure out who's who right that's a really common problem unfortunately in these local communities like that um I think if you're trying to trace parentage, you know, kind of try to distinguish between two individuals based on who their parents are, the um, lack of vital records information during this time period is, you know, very unfortunate. So wills and estates will often name children. Uh, this is kind of an early time period for census records. They're not really around yet. But if you're getting into until like late 1790s, if you have access to census records, though, those can be helpful. Um, and narrowing down households, but um, Bible records are another good source if um, if you have access to, and again, a lot of those are online and they're indexed. So um, there's some indexes online that are are helpful for that. But I, yeah, I think wills and estates, because they're going to name, they're going to list out the names of children, but they're also going to give you um, other names that you can make connections with. And um, so, yeah. And we have a recommendation for deeds as well in the chat. Absolutely. And I'll shout out that there's a, a current project called People Not Property that UNCG is heading up that's trying to gather a lot of the deeds that are still in the counties together in one central place uh, for that purpose. So that's a good shout. Yeah, it is definitely um, because, yeah, there, and, and not only will names be in deeds, a lot of times they will state the relationship. Also on that front, when dealing with enslaved persons, uh, Hoyer Mary asks, are there specific records of Indian slaves and slave traders? And I responded that there could be stuff in county records and General Assembly TNC, but I wasn't familiar with specific call outs. Are you, do you have any other advice on that? Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of like a record group or record series that pertains to um, that topic. You might find a uh, you know, in other groups like the General Assembly or county miscellaneous records are hugely helpful for that kind of thing um, that's going on in a county level. Um, but unfortunately, there's not one record series that you can go to that's going to to talk about that. Um, we know that enslaved persons show up in deeds. Um, we know that they're named in deeds sometimes. So it's quite possible that you would have that same situation with um, a Native American in in that document as well. That's entirely possible. Sorry, I'm replying to one in the chat, uh, just putting in our digital NCDCR URL. Uh, I'm going to go to some questions that I haven't had a chance to respond to because they've come in after the presentation. Uh, the first one is, what sort of records are available concerning the Glasgow land fraud? <laughs> um, there is actually some really good, and I, I don't want to go to abstracts. I really don't. But there's actually um, an abstract that's been done that kind of that talks about the records that we have here. Um, they're all over the account books. Um, there's a whole volume that's dedicated to that. Some of that's in Tennessee as well, because that land fraud that was going on was, some of that was involving what is now Tennessee and that area. So um, there's records 
that they would have about that as well, because so much of that fraud is going on in the Western part where there's really nobody to regulate that. But um, there's, there's, you know, it's possible that there's records in the General Assembly or the governor's papers about that, um, any kind of legal issues that are going on that, that are being sent to them would be recorded. Um, but there's a, there is a really good um, abstract that was done by one of our staff many years ago, which is online about that topic. Uh, we did have a lot of questions asking if you would be willing to send slides. I assume that if we get the slides to Adrian and Danny, we're, you can send those out to the attendees. Sure. Uh, um, the next question I can answer because this is more in our government records processing. Uh, Virginia has digitized court records as opposed to wills and estates. Are there plans to make those records di available digitally by county? Not by us. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are some court records that are digitized by Family Search and Ancestry. They've digitized some of the court minutes. Um, we try to focus on digitizing records that we don't think Ancestry and Family Search are going to scan that might still have genealogical or historical value, uh, which is why we did something like the tax lists uh, from those early years that they didn't weren't interested in. Uh, the recent Revolutionary War collection is more historical, but it has a lot of genealogical information in it. The also, also, court records are simply very, very voluminous. Uh, when you get past colonial years and into later years, especially the 20th century, it's the bulk of county records and it's enormous. We only have so many resources for digital digitization in terms of staff and server space. So we have to prioritize what we can. Um, and that's going back to it, what we were talking about, um, how we um, prioritize what we're going to digitize. And exactly, I mean, a lot of those county records have already been put online. Uh, we didn't talk really about the district court records, but um, within the state agency, there was the early district courts, which were basically handling um, issues that were higher up than pleasing quarters, but it was before you had a superior court system established within each county. So counties were um, compiled into these districts, which are very similar to the fiscal districts that we looked at. But um, so we didn't really talk as much about them, but they've been digitized and they're on our website. And those are really helpful for um, uh, looking at some of the things that were going on in the slightly higher um, court records. But yeah, again, as Josh says, I mean, we we prioritize things that first are not online already, but that are also um, logistically that we can that we can do. And and our digital collections are, are arranged pretty much by subject. So I really encourage you to go to that page and just kind of take a look around and you'll see how they're subject oriented. And then within the subject are records from different groups that have been grouped together. Absolutely. Uh, the next question from Kirk Warner, are Dobbs County records maintained as part of Dobbs County? Or are they part of Wayne County or other adjacent counties which received part of Dobbs? Um, yes, they are their own group. We have, I think we don't really have much from Dobbs County. Um, we have there's other defunct counties like Albemarle and Tryon County that we do have some records for. Uh, we do have, you know, like I think just maybe some court minutes from Dobbs County, but the, but if they do exist, they should be here. And um, the other thing about counties being formed out of defunct counties is that the, the courthouses remained where they were. So if the courthouses had had records they may not necessarily they weren't necessarily transferred to another county um so you're not going to find a lot of counties mixed in together like that if that makes sense yeah but, there is a dobbs county record group but there's also a chance there might be some dobbs county court cases that are in the wayne county early records as well so yeah i mean it's there's worth some, checking yeah definitely it's it's mainly court records i think um the next question is would enslaved persons show up uh, as part of tax lists uh, yeah, I mean, not necessarily by name, but there's going to be, um, and I think it also depends on the time period as well as to whether or not that's taxable property, um, I, because that's how they're thinking of it. They're thinking of it as property. Um, so 
I don't know that that shows up a lot in just like county tax records, um, but it's possible that you would would have that on a tax record. But again, it's not going to give you names and it's not going to give you any genealogical information about that. Um, I would say like no on that um, unless you got really lucky. As yeah. Far as Whether or not a person ha owned a slave, probably. Whether what those names are, no. Mm -mm. Yeah. Um, we had two two questions for the same thing, basically. Uh, how can we make an appointment to search the archives? Um, you don't have to, uh, uh, fantastically. Allison, uh, since you're in the search room and correspondence, we also had some questions come in about how to request records remotely. So if you want to tell people what they, what to do if they're coming in and then what to do if they're sending in a request. Yeah, definitely. Uh, briefly, as Josh says, you don't need to make an appointment. Uh, we are open, our open hours. Uh, are on our website. We're open Tuesday through Friday from nine to five and then Saturdays from nine to one. So please drop on by anytime during those times. Again, no appointment needed. Um, the Once you arrive in the search room, uh, you don't necessarily, we don't necessarily pull records ahead of time, but feel free to send us a list of things specific that you know you want to look at before you come and then that way we can determine uh, whether or not there we have some records that are housed in other buildings so we want to make sure that we have those records available when you come but so yeah definitely feel free to send us a list um and remotely uh the archives email that's on the last slide here that's where you can email us to um send a list of items if you're planning on coming or if you have any questions about the rules or policies of visiting the search room um if you have any questions about ordering copies remotely, uh, that is the email that you can reach us um, at. We do, the correspondence unit is set up to send out copies of specific records. So um, we're not really able to answer questions about, you know, performing genealogy on a broad level. But what we what we can do is to help you decide on maybe a record that would be helpful for you. And then we can send you a copy of that record if you're unable to visit in person. If you have any kind of question or any kind of um, request, that archives at dncr.nc.gov is, is where you can send those. And we had some questions during the meeting if people who are out of state are allowed to look at records. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, these records are available for anyone around the world. Uh, so if you come to Raleigh, you can view them. And if you are out of state, there is a search fee um, for your uh, to look for records for you, but absolutely, we want you to look at these records. They're one of a kind. We're not going to just hoard them for people who just happen to live in North Carolina. They belong to they belong to the citizens of North Carolina, but they're available for everyone, and we, and we want would them to be open to everybody. Yeah, we would love for everyone to visit so we can we can we can share in your research. We love it. We've had people visit the archives from all over the world. I mean, we had someone come over, come over earlier this year from Italy doing a research project. So yeah. New Zealand, I mean, it's, so please come to Raleigh and, or uh, send in Allison an email. Let's see our, our next question. And Allison, if you need to leave, please, uh, please let me know. Um, our, our next question is a very specific genealogy question. So I would recommend on this one that you probably want to come in and do a little bit more on this. Uh, but the, I'll read the question. Uh, one of my great grandfathers was Colonel Daniel Smith. I'm trying to prove that Sarah Smith Harrison was his daughter. Would there be a will? Where could I look for information on him? I heard there was a family Bible, but when I went to Asheville to his son's home and asked, they had no information. Uh, so I know that's probably more specific than for the whole program because we can look for that when a specific query, you can email us for that. Mm -hmm. But how would folks find out if we have a will or a family Bible? Um, there's some things that you can do um, through our online catalog. Our wills up to 1900 have been indexed by name in our online catalog. So you can sit there at home and, and do different kinds of spellings, um, different counties. You can search that way. Estate files are not indexed to a name level in our online catalog, but we do have some that have been um, that are in container lists that are available on our website by county. Um, family search, again, I, I don't I just point out that it's a free 
website. You have to create an account, but it is free. So you can also do that from home and they have a lot of those records that are indexed. But as far as what we can do, um, drop us an email and you know we can check our guide, our indexes and see. Um, and then work with you on getting you a copy if that's what you what you need. And the um, family Bibles that we do have are um, copies of the Bibles because it's the family, mm -hmm. just the family page. But those are also in the catalog. So you can check that in there, too. They are. And our digital collections website. Um, also, I just also encourage you to keep checking that out are the bible records that we house here in, and the cemetery records we have some cemetery records um that were done by the wpa in the 1930s where they basically just went out and, and transcribed tombstones um but those are digitized and they're on in our family records uh collection so if you're interested in bible records or cemetery records they're available to search through that collection And our last question, at least for now, it looks like, but, but it's one that I know is near and dear to uh, your heart because you wrote the blog on it, literally. Uh, are there any records on committees of safety? Oh, wow. Yes, um, there are. And I wish that I'd had time to go into those because I literally was back and forth about, you know, not being too, taking too long. But yes, we definitely have committee of safety records from um, Wilmington from Rowan County, the different kinds of committees that were set up. Um, there's a New Bern committee, uh, and those have all been digitized. They're in our Revolutionary War era collection. So um, they're a great source, and I, I'm so glad they're online because you can, you know, flip through them. Um, they're so fascinating because of the information that they include, they're talking about. I mean, they were pretty much um, authorized by the General Assembly to be the local authorization i mean they're they're enforcing uh militia laws they're overseeing the um the goods that were being sold they were fixing prices but they were also keeping an eye on what was going on in the whole neighborhood so they were reporting this back and they um they have some really great information about the local neighborhoods like rowan and new Bern and wilmington i mean the wilmington um, committee of safety they are watching Governor Martin closely. So that's an interesting back and forth talking about, you know, he's he's out there in the river and we're watching you. And, you know, he's talking about how those committees of safety won't leave me alone. I'm just trying to do my job. So um, yeah, we definitely, so definitely the main answer to that is, is that yes, they've been digitized and they're on our digital collections website. So, and I added to the chat that your two blogs on committees of safety that we wrote for documenting the world of Outlander, one on the general committees of safety and one specifically on Rowan yes. uh, County. Um, definitely. Well, speaking of Rowan, another question just came in. Do we have records of the committee of correspondence, specifically Rowan, but also more general? There are some, but I'm not as familiar with what they um, include. But there is committees of correspondence. Um, they're in that Secretary of State um, Congress series, I believe, is what they're in. I don't yeah, think there's they're less of it than there is com yeah. uh, committee of safety, there's, but there, we do have some. We do have some. Uh, I don't think they're online like the committees of safety are, but if you have a specific a specific, a specific question about them, please email us and we can find out that answer for you. And finally, uh, a, a comment from Holly Jeffries. If you find a family Bible at a yard sale, a state sale or antique store, many DAR organizations will take them to record the dates in them. So good to, good to know. Great. Thank you, Holly, yeah. for letting us know that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've gone through all the questions. There were 36 questions as, uh, asked in the QA uh, during the whole of that and afterward. Uh, so thank you so much. If your question wasn't answered and you still have some uh, and we're about to end, please make sure you contact Allison at the email address mm -hmm. right here on the screen or the general email address, archives.dncr.nc.gov. We wish you the best of luck as you continue your Revolutionary War genealogical or historical research and keep an eye out for future America 250 programs from the State Archives in North Carolina. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you very, very much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you.